Well, good afternoon and thank you so much for joining today's webinar. At Orange, we are convinced that the global pandemic is changing the way that we live and work well into the future. Many organisations around the region are now executing their return to the office plans, while at the same time, Jack Dorsey announces to his 5,000 Twitter employees that should they not wish to, they will never be required to return to the office. As your trusted digital transformation advisor, it's our job to support you during this time of transition. And to that end, today we have a jam-packed agenda. I'll shortly hand over to Sahum, our Vice President for the Middle East and Africa, to welcome you on behalf of both Orange Business Services and Orange Silicon Valley. We'll then hear from Jameson, Senior Product Manager at Orange Silicon Valley, who will share how recent events have reshaped enterprise's decision calculus around investing in digital technologies. He'll then be followed by Alex, Principal at Orange Silicon Valley, who will provide a look into how industry leaders are adapting to new patterns of digital usage and new cybersecurity threats. Thank you, and I'll now hand over to Sahum. Thank you for the organizers in our region. We are really happy to see you here. With this pandemic still raging around the world, most of the investors have found their way to cope with the most urgent problems and short-term issues. Most of more changes will be necessary to adapt to our reality. And changes go hand in hand with innovation. With Orange Business Services, it's our job to assist and innovate with you to achieve the transformation and of the network underlying you. The present is fundamentally changing the enterprise and the nature of the world. And you can see it even personally, I'm actually working from home in some days. And therefore, the need for network and cloud transformation and these changes are even leading to a repositioning of IT within the enterprise. Today, there is no doubt that the companies already have stated their digital transformation journey and in a better position to manage the current disruption. They are more resilient to its adverse impact, and although the pandemic has been a dynamic shock to all, it may also create opportunities. For example, it obliged companies to reshape their business model and network for the new normal and thus to enhance the business resiliency relevance and sustainability. So what does the ideal network look like in the new normal? In the past, a network was often designed to connect sites of applications in the data center. Tomorrow, users will move to the internet and work from home and from everywhere else. With application in the cloud, obviously SD-WAN provides a very good solution to support these demands of network transformation and to provide the flexibility of multi-cloud connectivity around the world. To shape your own new working environment, you might feel the need to sit back a bit and observe the inspiration from others. Indeed, not all countries and industries have reached in the same way, and good ideas are to be found in the market. Within Orange, we are lucky to have a team based in Dubai dedicated to the analysis of the IT and telecom sector. Indeed, Orange Silicon Valley has been an intelligent output for our group for 20 years, covering the new development in place where innovation is daily bread and butter and where the future changes in technology are developed. Employing near 40 business analysts covering their own specific domain, they have focused over the past month of how major market players act and what can be learned with the position during the crisis and beyond. I will now hand over to Jameson. Thank you. Thank you, Sahem. It's a pleasure to be on this call today. I am a senior product manager from Orange Silicon Valley Innovation Office in San Francisco, and I'll be walking you through a presentation we're calling Next Normal Enterprise. Uh, it was one of 12 uh, webinars that are being led out of our office on how the pandemic is influencing several spheres that Orange operates in. I think it's important to step back and ask, why are we here? Uh, the recent events have triggered in the United States a, a dramatic transformation with regards to unemployment. Uh, this is uh, unparalleled in the history of recorded data. Uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics keeps really good data going back to 1967. These are uh, weekly unemployment claims. And if you look at what's happened recently in light of the 1970s energy crisis, or the 2008 financial crisis, they, they really don't compare. Uh, we started hitting several million unemployment uh, claims, job insurance claims per week uh, in about mid-March. 
Ad additionally, this uh, the United States federal government responded in kind by issuing the uh, signing the CARES Act with associated increases in U.S. public debt uh, as they disperse that to the uh, to the people of the country. And to put this uh, recent rise of $3 trillion in three months into perspective, the total outstanding U.S. currency worldwide in circulation, that's hard dollar denominated currency, is about $1.9 trillion. Uh, so within a, less than a month, it was a 13% increase in the total outstanding debt. Now, interestingly, about 60% of hard currency in the United States is owned abroad. It, it could be in bank accounts, but it could also be in uh, under mattresses elsewhere. Uh, so the likely inflationary burden of this increased uh, liquidity or increased uh, monetary easing is distributed by all of the holders of the currency. And I think it's really one of the only ways that the U.S. feels comfortable uh, with the increased debt. And in fact, the Federal Reserve just last month on the 27th of August came out and announced that they were targeting inflation, that they had revised their policy and that they were looking at a 2 to 2.5 percent static inflation rate. Uh, in my opinion, I, I think this was more of a reaction uh, saying we're embracing what's going to happen rather than a proactive strategy. But they claimed since the early 2000s, many central banks around the world are embracing monetary policy known as inflation targeting. Um, and I think we, you know, we can see that coming. So what was the impact of COVID-19 on the enterprise? It was really an acceleration of existing digital transformation initiatives. Uh, Accenture's CEO said that pre-crisis, her customers were held back by hierarchy, they were held back by culture, and then with the pandemic, all of a sudden you had an absolute shift where every part of the organization had to change. Uh, and now that they've been able to move in a much more agile fashion, uh, they don't want to go back. It's hard to take something away when you become used to it, uh, and it's better, a better approach. Uh, the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, similarly said that we've seen two years' worth of digital transformation in just two months, from remote work and learning, sales and customer support, uh, to critical cloud. So from my perspective, digital transformation showed a certain arc, and there were many companies that were looking to achieve it by, say, 2030, uh, and the pandemic just pushed up those those timelines. So what is digital transformation? The way we see it in Silicon Valley is there are core and adjacent transformations. Core is taking a business-as-usual process, like a contact center or other customer engagement, and moving it from a, a relatively manual process where people pick up the phone and are called to a digital process where it may be even a chat bot that responds to the call. The more difficult uh, digital tra transformation for companies to grasp is when it, it's adjacent to your core business. So in the, the, the example here is auto manufacturers are producing good cars, uh, but as we move to a, a mobility as a service business model and a transportation as a service business model with Uber and Lyft and equivalent regional uh, mobility players, this is an entirely new business for the auto OEMs and very difficult for them to, to get their uh, mind around. You, you've seen U.S. auto OEMs begin to invest in self-driving technology as a result. The recent pandemic has also been a test of remote work. Uh, there was an interesting study done by Adam Ozemek, the chief economist at Upwork. He issued the study without the pandemic in mind in November 2019, and then reissued it after the pandemic in April 2020. Uh, the percentage of HR managers in North America polled that said they had no remote workers was 46% in November 2019, and it dropped to 6% by 2020, uh, and a 74% increase in, in the percentage of companies that had uh, some remote work. The percentage that were fully remote went from 2.3% to 20%, so an 8.7x increase. Uh, the percentage of remote teams, or the percentage of the team that is remote, went from 13 to 56 to 74%. In terms of how sticky this will be, uh, post-COVID, 21% in anticipate entirely remote teams within five years, 
And this is up 65% from the pre-COVID level. So we think, and I think the data reflects, that there is probably a long-term transition here. It's not just a temporary transition. And some of the major tech companies have already embraced that. As Kelly said at the top of the hour uh, with the, the tweet from Jack Dorsey, uh, Facebook, similarly, the CEO Mark Zuckerberg said in a town hall meeting that some employees will have the option to work from home permanently. Uh, Shopify, more bold in his proclamation, the CEO uh, tweeted that as of today, they are a digital by default company and office centricity is over. Uh, you, you can hear uh, some folks who are in commercial real estate uh, paying attention to, to his tweet. Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft, or GAFAM, as they refer to them in Europe, all announced extended deadlines for return to work. So currently, uh, Google and Facebook are mid next year, July 2021. Uh, the others have announced certain dates, but they continually are pushing out as the pandemic has not resolved in the United States. Again, we believe the five-year outlook indicates a permanent shift from 30% uh, fully remote to 65% fully remote uh, within five years. We also saw uh, cloud revenues continue to march forward with their rise, uh, despite, and some say, because of the pandemic. Uh, Amazon Q2 revenue, AWS specific revenue was up 29% year over year to $10.8 billion per quarter. Uh, Microsoft up 47% and Google up 43%, but on much lower basis. Uh, they're not as dominant as AWS. But I, I like this quote that as the pandemic moves in, on-premise moves out. Now, this is already a trend we, we were seeing. There's a, a, a significant growth in cloud revenues uh, from several hundred billion today to uh, approaching one trillion in annual revenues by 2022. The pandemic is likely just accelerating this as people don't want to go into the office. Or put it another way, any legacy software that required an employee to be on campus has just been trashed. This is a CEO of a new and young startup that we've worked with on a couple of projects, speaking at their annual developer event in April in the midst of the pandemic. And we've seen it a little bit in, in regards to our own office. It's, we have to go through quite a hurdle to get to the office today. So if you're working on a project, if you can do it remote, that's better. Business applications are also surging. Uh, the, number, the download of business applications year over year saw a 90% increase versus the 2019 average. And the top uh, business apps uh, are video conferencing so that we can conduct meetings like this one, uh, or job search uh, is the fourth leading app or business app as of June. Uh, video conferencing and collaboration, we all know that the use has gone uh, through the roof. Cisco WebEx blog only produced figures early in the pandemic. I think there's actually a, an interest in not appealing or not appearing to take too much advantage of the current scenario. Uh, but early in the pan pandemic in March, they reported 2,200% uh, growth in their traffic to the China backbone as uh, the pandemic affected them prior to the United States. Zoom, despite their controversy over security vulnerabilities, uh, boasted more than 300 million daily active unique users, up from 200 million a, a month prior. So even in Silicon Valley, where we uh, really focus on engagement metrics, they may not be dollar denominated. They may be more time and share of uh, share of a person's day. Th these are these are pretty astounding growth figures. Um, Microsoft Teams similarly posted 75 million daily active unique users trying to compete with Zoom, although I think uh, it, you know not the same product. Um, and they pr produced more than 200 million meetings in a single day. And probably more interestingly, prior to the pandemic in 2018, they only had about 170K as their largest customer. Uh, during the pandemic, the number of customers with 100,000 subs or more went from 20 in April to 69 uh, by uh, August, the Q, Q, their Q4, even though it's you know, Q2 for the most companies. Um, and Accenture, as a single company, now has more than 500,000 Teams accounts. So uh, significant growth for their SaaS enterprise management product. 
unfortunately, I think we'll also see an acceleration of automation and job replacement. Uh, the National Bureau of Economic Research found that 88% of all job loss occurs within 12 months of a dated recession. Uh, and the jobless recoveries uh, basically happen when aggregate employment doesn't come back as quick as rebounds in economic output, meaning that the economy comes back, the jobs don't. On the right is a chart from Barclays Equity Research. We already saw the significant growth of annual CAGR of uh, the collaborative robotics market. Uh, this is a growing and interesting uh, market for industrial automation. It probably is accelerated by the pandemic. A little vignette of that in San Francisco, where I live. My friend owns five burger restaurants. They're really good burgers. Uh, she had to close all of them in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, but Creator, a robot burger ma uh, machine from uh, Google Ventures, uh, added dining hours and announced extended service. So you, you can see the comparison, right? If you can get a burger from a machine, uh, you, you're probably interested in doing that when there's a global pandemic. E-commerce is also booming. I took a second look at the second quarter for Shopify Square and Amazon, and the numbers are astounding. Uh, Shopify year-over-year -year revenue doubled, uh, which for a company of their scale is, is very impressive. And they directly attributed it to the pandemic. We've seen the COVID-19 pandemic fundamentally shift the way business and consumers interact. It's catalyzing e-commerce and introducing major changes in buying behavior. Uh, and, and their COO said that it's basically pulling forward what they thought retail would look like in 2030 into 2020. And Shopify is a company that just helps other companies get online, so like a neutral Amazon. Square saw net revenue grew 64% year over year to two, nearly $2 billion. And their cash app, uh, which is a, a way of sending and receiving money digitally, saw an increase of 50% of use year over year. Uh, Amazon, we all know with the pandemic, has, has, has fared very well. Uh, their net sales increased 40%. Uh, which on a, on a number of approaching $89 billion is, is quite a lot uh, in, the, in the second quarter compared to year over year. We also see a digital transformation in contact center and the way enterprises manage their customer relationships. We already knew this was happening. The preferred method for customers when they engage brands is email. Uh, there are up to 11 supported by enterprises, uh, but um, – most enterprises have no cross-channel customer management strategy. So to a customer, it can look like they're dealing with one brand. To a brand, it can deal like, it'll look like the customer is interfacing with marketing or sales or support, but they are not unified on the back end. One little fun vignette, um, a Harvard Business Review study found that a massive uptick in uh, customers and representatives saying, I can't understand you as people move to home audio with uh, interference on the line and with uh, unique home network environments. But digital delivery of customer service is absolutely essential with people confined to their homes. We also see uh, the COVID-19 pandemic as a force majeure or frankly legal excuse. And we've seen certain companies attribute the pandemic to massive layoffs. Some of them are a clear cut uh, understood why, Fun, TripAdvisor being in the travel space, Airbnb as well. Uh, but some of them, like Automatic, which completely shut down in the pandemic and attributed it to COVID-19, really it's, it's hard to draw a, an understanding of why. Automatic makes a connected car appliance. It's an aftermarket uh, solution. They were acquired by Sirius, and Sirius chose to shut them down, uh, take the technology and, and drop the business and drop the cloud services that were probably costing them a lot in the midst of the pandemic. So I think we'll, we'll see additional uh, reductions in staff as companies right size and take advantage of the opportunity. It's also been a significant network stress test. Orange saw a 700% increase in the number of enterprise users connecting remotely. Video conferencing up is 20, uh, video conferencing is up 20 to 100% on our network. And we're seeing renewed interest in zero trust architectures as people are, teams are increasingly distributed. Uh, Google saw 25 times growth on Google Meet, their new video conferencing platform, between January and March. 
Uh, and on March 24th, they had to reduce the quality of YouTube videos globally to ease network traffic. Uh, they wouldn't say how much, uh, but it, or, and how many video streams had gone up, uh, but it's pretty astounding that they had to do that. So there's a fun meme floating around the internet. It's uh, attributed to somebody named Suzanne Wolk on Twitter, but it's who led the digital transformation of your company? Was it your CEO, your CTO, or COVID-19? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, please, if you'd like to be in contact, we, we would love to, to speak with you. And Kelly, I'll hand it back to you and to my colleague, Alex. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Alex Shakia, and I'm the, uh, I lead the cybersecurity practice at Orange Silicon Valley. So in this session, I would love to explore the current global pandemic and the way to accelerating the rate of innovation in cybersecurity and connectivity and how the network operators have adapted um, at the height of the uh, uh, at the height of the pandemic. We'll also try to look a little bit into the post pandemic world in terms of uh, in terms of these three uh, subjects, as well as uh, how cybersecurity is going to guard the digital lives of consumers during the during the pandemic. So 2020 started off. Um, uh, strong with the world more connected than it has ever been. At the beginning of the year, most mobile operators around the world were focusing on rolling out their 5G technologies. Um, they were actively working on either fixed wireless access products or 5G mobile services. And then as the uh, COVID-19 epidemic became a pandemic um, in late February, beginning of March, uh, everything changed. Um, and at the time, the unprecedented shelter in place policies enacted uh, worldwide have just reinforced the importance of, um, of uh, connectivity and networks in our lives, um, as well as uh, cybersecurity as the guardian of digital lives. Um, and millions of com employees and, uh, and companies moved their activities online overnight, uh, which made their um, uh, securing their connections and networks a crucial activity uh, for the survival of economies. Um, at Orange, we assisted our customers during the COVID-19 crisis by deploying both appliance-based as well as virtual-based solutions at scale. As, um, as people sheltered in place, as my colleague um, Jameson just, just mentioned, this massive migration online has just been increasing the demands on, on networks significantly. Um, at Orange, of course, we've seen uh, an increase of 700% in enterprise users connecting remotely. We've seen video conferences, video conferencing going up. Um, the, the total U.S. traffic has gone up um, uh, significantly um, for, for multiple uh, multiple uh, areas such as instant messaging and gaming and voice calls, et cetera. Um, and, of course, social media and digital entertainment consume, uh, consumption grew exponentially. Telco operators um, and large tech platforms have shown remarkable resilience during the pandemic. While there haven't been any large-scale outages today, telcos had to quickly adapt to new patterns of digital usage as well as new cybersecurity threats. Overall, the network operators and the large tech platforms were able to weather the surge in demand and accommodate for, for this new usage pattern, uh, primarily because um, networks are generally designed to handle peaks and are built ahead of forecasted demand. Um, and the operators try to be around 18 months ahead of where they forecast that demand. In addition, when most op when when the pandemic started, most operators initiated the process of temporarily borrowing spectrum for any anticipated traffic spikes in case of urgent need. The the statistics at Orange um, have shown you know like a 400% increase in voice traffic, 300% increase in cloud video and uh, platform capacity to reply to these customer requirements, and we've seen more than six uh, 6,600 audio and web conferencing customers uh, that were created in less than three. Uh, weeks. Prior to the pandemic, um, we've seen um, the move towards software control network virtualization um, was already sweeping the industry. And this technology uh, allows operators to adapt quickly to enable more services to keep up with demand. Um, as an example, as video conferencing is increasing at significant rates, carriers could also offer targeted plans that can offer better quality of service to, for these applications through prioritization and so on. Um, for both uh, over-the-top and uh, carrier offered. The pandemic will only accelerate this transition, which will be boosted by edge computing and the broader deployment of 5G. Uh, Orange is working to co-innovate with customers um, using 5G to answer, uh, to answer uh, use cases around ultra-high speed, uh, HD video downloads, connected vehicles, factories of the future, and smart stadiums. Cybersecurity was important um, before the COVID-19 pandemic and continues to be top of mind in the current environment. 
Um, as the majority of the workforce transitioned to working remotely on our secured home networks, uh, security became really, really uh, a critical issue. Um, during the pandemic, we've seen uh, companies like Barracuda Networks coming out and reporting that phishing attempts have been soaring by over 600%. Um, at some point, uh, Google's Gmail uh, product was catching um, over 100 million COVID-19 themed phishing emails. So we've seen a, 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 a great uh, a, um, push from, from hackers to monetize, uh, monetize this pandemic. As the coronavirus spread worldwide, cyber criminals try to capitalize on the global health crisis by deploying attacks with a, with a COVID-19 theme. Um, again, there was malware and phishing that was used as a pretext to escalate these attacks. Uh, we have also seen sophisticated instances of watering hole attacks using COVID-19 maps to drop exploits and malware. Cybersecurity researchers uh, believe this trend is likely to persist and escalate in different forms. We've seen it over the summer in July with the attacks on Twitter um, that were COVID-19 themed. Probably uh, uh, around the election in the U.S., um, uh, we're going to see a more uh, more attacks of this of this sort. In the meantime, uh, as more online activity has moved to unsecured home networks, the attack surface expanded. We have therefore seen targeted attacks against medical organizations involved in uh, researching, treating, or otherwise responding to COVID-19 pandemic um, in the Western world. For example, here in San Francisco, we've seen the ransomware attack against the University of California at San Francisco, and we anticipate that this will continue as various state and activist groups escalate their efforts. And the COVID-19 crisis is a global one. Um, However, these geopolitical tensions that existed before predate the pandemics and are likely to be increased during this time. And we expect to see new waves of state-sponsored cyber attacks, cyber disruptions as the pandemic um, um, stays longer with us and which may have an immediate effect on how people and how governments actually handle the pandemic. As more and more people work from home uh, using fully designed and implemented remote access solutions, uh, we anticipate that attacks against remote access technologies such as VPN gateways and poorly secured uh, home and shared Wi-Fi access points will increase and contribute to serious compromises occurring. During this time, more and more computing activity will move to cloud, forcing security programs to consider local and cloud infrastructures in their strategies. Most businesses are accelerating their move to online commerce if um, they have not done so already, especially in the retail sector. We've seen a, 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 a mad dash to go online. So we expect there will be a, an accumulation of security debt as security is sacrificed in favor of uh, speed to market. Compared to the, to the 5G, um, um, the, uh, compared to 4G, 5G is a complex ecosystem. So we're seeing multiple stakeholders that require um, trusted and trouble-free interaction between them. Overall, the 5G security should be a holistic approach involving uh, people, processes, and technology. Um, we're seeing a lot of security challenges on, on the 5G front, things such as virtualization of the attack surface, dynamically distributing uh, uh, data, shared resources and privacy sensitive uh, uh, data, cloud orchestration and, and, and vulnerabilities. Therefore, we believe this security architecture should be flexible enough to support uh, various use cases, things such as end-to-end -end security approach that includes controls at radio transport uh, points, uh, the telco cloud um, devices and IoT um, managed endpoints, firmware updates, traffic analysis, and so on. Um, so we're seeing this as being the next, um, the next generation of, of security, especially as it relates to mobile operators. As my colleague Jameson mentioned, the zero trust architectures um, and uh, secure access service edge are the clear winners of this pandemic. The COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic accelerated the zero trust and SASE adoption. Um, primarily the way people uh, connect remotely was via VPN, but VPN was designed for a very small remote workforce and is no longer suitable for today's environment, uh, primarily because of uh, three things. Uh, first of all, most of the enterprise applications are moving to the cloud, so there's no need for us to identify ourselves on premise. Um, more and more employees are mobile, and there are many types. Um, we have contractors that don't need to access all of the applications that reside on premise. They only need to access um, the applications um, that they were hired for. Um, so we're seeing a, a, a great adoption of uh, zero trust architecture. And furthermore, at the end of 2019, Gartner put out this new framework called Zero um, Access um, uh, uh, Service Edge, pronounced SASE. Um, which encompasses the um, uh, zero trust architecture and uh, provides uh, a, a network layer of, of security. 
they're estimating the adoption is going to go from 1% at the end of 2018 to 40% of that new security type by 2023. The COVID-19 pan pandemic has changed the um, security threat model in five important ways. Our colleagues at uh, uh, Orange Cyber Defense um, have um, have put out a, a really interesting white paper over the summer, um, and um, we believe that in today's environment, employees are more vulnerable to social engineering and scams than normal, primarily because they're working from home. Um, the companies have less control and visibility than usual over the IT systems, again, because the uh, attack surface has moved into the home of people, and um, now the Wi-Fi's and the routers and the, all the access points are part of this enterprise stack that um, that companies no, no, don't have control over. Um, users may be connecting from, from maybe connecting from insecure or poorly configured environments. Um, in certain countries, that may actually mean uh, an insecure physical environment. For example, people working from internet cafes um, where somebody can look over your shoulder. Uh, as I mentioned. Uh, there was a rush to, to implement a, a lot of uh, remote access systems. Uh, a lot of companies went online, and, and in that rush, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the security implications have been actually um, have been actually uh, put on a back burner in favor of speed to market. Um, and furthermore, um, during this pandemic, companies and, and vendors may actually be operating with diminished capacity. So, how can we adapt to uh, to this uh, cyber security, this new world of, of cybersecurity, um, and um, I listed here like five things that that I believe companies can do uh, to keep up with, uh, uh, with the uh, changing environment. First of all, is you want to establish a visibility of your digital footprint to know which assets are actually open to attack. Uh, you want to minimize your attack surface by fixing misconfigured devices, patching, and removing obsolete assets. Um, so just really good hygiene on the first two points. Um, then you want to mitigate the risk of insider threat by really educating your workforce um, uh, around um, uh, around phishing scams and malware and so on. And lastly, you want to protect high-risk individuals, um, for example, um, people in the C-suite, um, and offer them in-depth training. Um, last, um, I'd like to address a, a, a few um, predictions of, of where we believe um, uh, life after COVID-19 pandemic is going to move in terms of uh, in terms of security. Um, uh, there, there's going to be uh, uh, SaaS delivered network connectivity and secure cloud access um, is increasingly important. The software defined uh, network architectures are going to become more prominent. The home routers and endpoints are now viewed as part of the enterprise security stack, as the home network is the new enterprise perimeter, we're already seeing companies come up and trying to offer solutions to protect the home from a business perspective. Um, introducing control on routers and access points to increase visibility of all assets that are connected to that network, so like your smartphone and smart plug and, and so on. Uh, we're going to see virtual uh, security operation centers, SOCs, uh, that enable remote analyst work and increase productivity and availability. We're going to see the increased adoption of MSSPs as cost-effective solution, MDM becomes quintessential components of enterprise security stack and extensions of that endpoint security. There's going to be an increased focus on security and testing of mobile applications throughout the software development cycle. Uh, so, so this, this movement uh, is called the shift left movement where you're kind of moving the security into the actual software development pro uh, process. Um, we're going to see detailed assessments and uh, quantification, prioritization, and response plans needed to minimize the risk associated with the third parties that you that companies interact with. Um, that will imply more robust and risk analysis that will account for large scale disruptions. Continuous assessments uh, through uh, crowdsourced um, uh, security testing, uh, and we'll see phishing solutions actually expand to protect additional channels. Uh, just uh, uh, um, you know, most communication is done. Is done is done virtually. You you have to make it more critical for users to verify that identity before before engaging. So we're going to see these new modernized identity platforms emerge for consumers and employees wherever they are located to to um, ensure the seamless connected uh, digital. Identity. With that, uh, I'd like to uh, end my talk briefly by um, telling you a little bit about the Orange Silicon Valley Corporate Co Innovation Program. Um, if you're interested in the trends in Silicon Valley or if you're interested in partnering or investing in startups, I uh, would really um, I'd like to hear from you. Um, and um, you can email any of my colleagues here. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you.
Thank you so much, Alex and Jameson, for such insightful sessions. And we'll now move to the Q&A portion of the event, which we have just five minutes to, to do. So I've had a nice question come through for you, Jameson. Uh, how will recent announcements by the US Federal Reserve regarding inflation targeting impact global organizations? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really profound question, and I, I can only answer from my perspective. But I, I, we're, we're going to see a lot more quoting earnings in constant currency when you get to the scale and scope of an orange, uh, because we want to avoid looking like results aren't as good as they are given currency fluctuations. In, when companies in, in the United States procure through their global supply chain networks with the U.S. dollar being worth just a little bit less over time, uh, that will trickle down the supply chain or up the supply chain uh, into other geographies where we may pay a certain amount for a, a certain good, but then our vendor realizes that that money is worth a bit less than it was previously. Now, the benefit of being the United States uh, – Good or bad for the rest of the world, we are the world reserve currency. So the inflationary burden that we shoulder from the recent massive capital infusion is spread across the globe. Uh, if uh, others, in, including folks in, in the Middle East and Africa uh, regions, continue to use dollar-denominated currency as a store of value, there's just a lot of currency out there to spread the inflation risk onto. Uh, I hope that answers the question. I, I think it's going to be, frankly, something we're keeping an eye on in the, the near term. That's great. And just a few minutes before we close, so I'll quickly squeeze one in for you, Alex. This year has been, we've seen some prominent cyber attacks like the Garmin ransomware and the Twitter attack. Apart from the COVID-19 theme, are we seeing something different in the nature of these attacks, or is this just simply business as usual for cyber criminals? So it's definitely not business as usual. Like they uh, definitely intensified the way the attacks are um, um, are being brought on um, is easier and easier by the day. There are all these um, uh, attack kits that uh, even the, the most simple-minded hacker can purchase off of the dark web and conduct an attack. Um, again, we're seeing a lot of um, uh, state-sponsored attack, primarily because of the um, uh, 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 because of the 2020 being an election year in the U.S. So we're seeing a lot of um, uh, a lot of attacks that are geopolitical in nature. Um, even the attack that that happened over the summer, a lot of people were speculating: could it be a a, 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 a sort of a dry run for the, the Twitter attack that happened over the summer. Could it be a dry run for something bigger in terms of uh, misinformation or a disinformation campaign? Um, so COVID-19 was a little bit um, kind of splitting the hacker community. Um, there were uh, hackers who were, I would say, a little bit more ethical in the sense of like not attacking, um, uh, you know, hospitals, not attacking uh, uh, research institutions that were battling uh uh, the uh, the virus, um, and then there were those who were just um, uh, you know this business businesses before uh, everything is uh, everything is fair play. Um, so we're seeing a lot of um, a lot of attacks uh, basically intensifying over this year. I've, I've seen a question in the chat. Um, uh, somebody asked, uh, "What is the current status of 5G network development, and who's the major supplier in the U.S.?" If I can uh, briefly touch on that. Current status, Verizon and at and have been pushing um, aggressively this year. Verizon made an investment of $500 million, uh, dedicated to this. They've been rolling out their technologies. Uh, AT&T um, uh, rolled out its first iteration in June, July. Uh, so over the summer, it was a little bit delayed. It was supposed to happen in the beginning of the year. Um, in the U.S., um, Verizon is um, primarily uh, working uh, uh, with Ericsson um, and the uh, and, and the combination is usually Ericsson and Nokia for, for uh, more, most of the networks um, in terms of um, uh, actual 5G equipment. And to comment to that, you know, with, with 5G and moving some of the network processing to the edge uh, with virtual packet cores and software-defined architectures, basically any carrier can, can, as long as they have spectrum rights, can deploy – uh, private networks anywhere in the world, which gets particularly interesting for some of our in industrial and manufacturing customers. We've uh, done some intelligent 
factory deployments, the first of which is on our core network uh, in France. Uh, but presumably over the, the medium term, this is something that uh, the OBS North America team is looking at as well. So what's, what is fascinating for me about uh, 5G is the enablement of bespoke solutions behind the enterprise firewall inside uh, your facility for higher throughput, uh, lower latency, more secure than Wi-Fi type communications. That's great. Thank you so much, guys. And I will now bring the session to a close. We hope that you found today's session really insightful. And if that was, in fact, the case, and you would like to speak to one of our experts around your accelerating digital transformation, then please follow the link that will come to you in the post-event email that's about to hit your inbox. Thank you so much, and have a lovely evening ahead.